Hello and welcome to the overcast, but still the sun and fun capital of the world, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I'm Dr. John Stamey for an extra special edition of Scary Cast. As one of my Monday night co-hosts says, it's my favorite night of the week when Monday rolls around. Well, it's always my favorite time of the day when we're doing a scary cast. And we got a great show for everybody today. Uh, I would like to introduce my co host from the mountains of North Carolina, the man with the radionics machines. And boy, he can make them, and they're great. The wonderful Brad Mulder, Dr. Brad Mulder. How are you doing today? I cannot complain. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well. I'm just I'm just cruising down the highway doing my favorite thing, which is running the scary cast. We're glad to have you here and uh we'll have you back uh you you've been co-hosting a little bit recently on our Monday nights, Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. We'll we're going to try to wrangle you in and get you to do more. But thanks for being here. Now today's guest is Somewhat of a superstar, not somewhat of a superstar, he's a heck of a superstar, and he's very entertaining, and he's very knowledgeable about his subject. I'd like to introduce to you Mark Sargent, who is a, a repeat offender. He's this, I think this is the third time he's been on ScaryCast, and we got to keep getting him on more because he's, he's a heck of a, a neat guy. He's got great opinions, and he is, I asked him what his title was before the show, we were in the green room, he said, Flat Earth Advocate, and I think that's great. So today's show is entitled Questions About the Flat Earth, because boy, Brad and I have got some questions, and they're, they're good questions that are going to really make everybody think. So Mark Sargent, we are so glad to have you here. How's it going today? It's going pretty well, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it a lot. You're, you're welcome. I, I always enjoy having you because... You're entertaining, you're fun, and I love your opinions. Because <laughs> opinions are the one thing that we like to deal with uh, in, in, here at ScaryCast. So anyway, tell us a little bit, what have you been up to recently? I know you are probably the world's leading flat earth advocate. You've produced documentaries, you've got shows, you've got all kinds of cool stuff going on. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you've got got going on and then brad and i are going to start with some questions okay uh well as since the pandemic stuff rolled back the mandates you know for, for the last three years we were we were suppressed quite a bit in 2019 we couldn't do anything wrong uh we i did conferences i think in seven countries i lost count of the amount of meetups and and the content was great and then uh i, I remember i was on my on my way to a mcdonald's commercial do a mcdonald's commercial in london and the border shut down because of some mysterious virus. And it's like, ah, oh, crap. And then we couldn't do, so we couldn't travel internationally and we couldn't do domestic stuff because domestic stuff, we couldn't find a venue. Like uh, uh, in 2020, we were supposed to do our big blowout conference in Vegas and we couldn't do it because Vegas, the whole city required masks for their, for their venues. And so once that rolled back, we, we finally got back into the swing of things. Uh, we're, we're back in action. In fact, next weekend, I'm traveling to uh, Los Angeles to do a big meetup down in Huntington Beach with a bunch of people doing a Q&A thing. There's rumor there's going to be an astronaut there. Can't wait to see if that happens. And, you know, make it, do a Tuesday night podcast with Karen B. And the, she is going to be moving the big conference, which was in North Carolina. We are finally going to be in Vegas. This October, it'll be called Flattoberfest, and we're going to be inviting you know, all the media and celebrities and you name it. It's going to be a very interesting time. Can't can't wait to see. I have never done a conference in Vegas. Uh, I've been there a few times for other things, but uh, it, it should be fun. So, meanwhile, in the meantime, hey, I'm now, now, this, sorry. Go ahead. This is Doctor John. I've got a quick question for you. Yeah. Uh, what day, do you know? What the days are? The dates are for that conference. Yeah, it'll be the third weekend of October. So I think it is, if I, let me look real fast, July, August, September, October. It would be the 21st and 22nd. Okay, great. I'm going to I'm going to ask you, would you be would you be okay with Scarycast being out there? Absolutely. A couple of live presentations? You bet. I, more the merrier. Right. You, no, gonna, please, please do come I'm out. See if I can get Brad yeah, I'm gonna see if I can get Dr. Brad Mulder to go out there with me. I think, Brad, I think we'll have a blast, don't you? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I got a few friends that live there, so I, I'm sure it'd be an interesting situation for sure. <laughs> yeah, I also I attended the one over in Spartanburg, South Carolina, I think two years ago. Oh, cool! Uh, oh, I wasn't, uh, yeah, I wasn't, was, I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. there at that one. If I'm not, pardon me. If I'm not mistaken, uh, I, I, Brad, I think that was the one I missed, right? The one from two years ago. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wanted to meet you, and I wanted to meet uh, Alex Stein, and so, uh, and uh, yeah, the two guys I wanted to meet. Yeah, I'm they so, weren't there. I'm but, so sorry. Uh, yeah. but, it wasn't. It wasn't my fault. It was the only Flattoberfest that I missed because the uh, the air. I, I remember coming back from the previous one, and they were using temperature guns on people's foreheads at the airport. It's like, what are you guys mm-hmm. doing? And it's like, it's like, what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to uh, fly out to that conference and get caught in a situation where, uh, you know, I couldn't I couldn't get on a plane. It's like, oh no no no, we're not we're not playing this. So. Anyway, but I was at the one last year. Sorry, I missed yeah. you though. I I feel bad. So, oh, oh, that's quite all right. It's quite all right. There's always a first time. But uh, you know, here's what got me. Uh, I knew a professor of advanced mathematics. I mean, this person was uh, a a freaking uh, uh, you know genius. And you know, you walk into their office, they bring nothing but volumes of handwritten formulas and calculations. I mean, you just name it. And and uh, anyway, I came to the conclusion this person was really super intelligent and was actually, you know, was what they claimed to be. And uh, they told me, by the way, the earth is flat. And I looked at them like, huh? I said, the earth is flat. And they started telling me, you know, different versions of World War II and everything else. I'm, and this is really where I kind of like, I was already, I was already into, interested in the Mandela effect, but then the flat earth thing came about. And then I saw this video i think karen b was over in the netherlands and they did a laser uh experiment across a lake that was 40 miles from shore to shore is this yeah. correct yeah yeah the uh lake lake balaton okay. in uh i think it was hungary yeah hey could you tell the audience about that because i really want to hear uh, you know, directly from somebody. Yeah, we uh, we sent a we sent a group over there, and Karen Karen was there as well. And uh, they thought, well, if you're going to shoot a laser across a body of water, your best bet to 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 ensure accuracy would be a frozen lake somewhere. And so they went to Lake Balaton and in Hungary. If I'm, I'm pretty sure I got that right. And shot a, a laser, you know, from one end to the other, and it, the temperatures was horrible. Like, I like, think a couple guys got pneumonia on that trip. It was so brutal. And in fact, they had to go to their backup laser because the the primary laser froze, and uh, it, it worked. And Guinness Book of World Records was there, and they they noted it as well. And we didn't get a lot of traction from it from the uh, uh, the from the the anti flat Earth people for whatever reason. Don't know. They just they just wanted to disregard it. It's like okay. That's fine, but it inspired a lot of people to do other tests across other bodies of water. So that was that was great. Yeah, I saw a similar test over uh, from uh, Salt Lake in Utah. Yep. And I think it was, the, it was like from 20 miles from shore to shore. And what I don't know what the curvature rate is. I think it's like at what 225 feet, something in that neighborhood. If memory serves, probably like, uh, 20 miles. Uh, but anyway, yeah, and they shot a laser. It it hit it went across shore twenty miles straight, and also you could see the the, the uh, buildings that were, that were on that part of you know where the laser was you know where the the target was yeah. on the other side you could see buildings that were like one of them was like a tower almost uh, two hundred twenty five feet and you could see all the way from the shore to the top twenty miles away yeah yeah so yep I hear you explain I mean. Oh, explain explain how that works. Yeah, why that's convinced. This. Why that proves to people that it's a flat Earth type of thing. Please. Oh yeah. So the the mainstream mainstream says, and we didn't come up with this, is that, uh, and I know you have to take in some trigonometry after five hundred miles, but anything less than five hundred miles away, distant, 
uh, the, the curvature of the Earth is 8 inches per mile squared, or 8 inches per mile per mile. And that doesn't mean every, eight in, every mile is 8 inches. That would be a, a slope. I mean, it's got to be a curved surface, so it gets more and more severe until it finally goes vertical. But anyway, for the first 500 miles, 8, eight inches per mile squared, that's been the accepted formula for years. And, and I love that anti-flat earthers try to dispute this. It's like, oh, no, you have to take a trick. In fact, I come at them. I say, fine, if it's not 8, eight inches per mile squared, what is it? And no one will give me the answer. And I go, I go, fine. That's what we're going to use. Anyway, so what that means is at 10, at let's say 10 miles. 10 miles is 10 times 10, which is 100 times 8, which is 800 inches. So there's 800 inches of curvature uh, at 10 miles and, and so on and so on. And to where when you're at 50 miles, it's about 1,700 feet, give or take. Which means whatever's out there, you should not be able to see. It's on the other side of the hill. And, and w w what does that mean with anything? Well, everyone knows back in the day, in fact, all the way up until very recently, like 20 years ago, when you saw a boat going off into the distance, it would disappear. And people would say, oh, well, it's gone over the curvature of the earth. And everybody accepted that. It's like, well, I can't see it. And you said it was the curvature. And we know there is a curvature, so it has to be the curvature. And now we know that's that's not true anymore. What what really changed the game was HD technology. You can go out with a you know over the counter you know five hundred dollar HD camera, and you can zoom in on things that were gone. You know it's like a, where that boat is gone. I saw it. It left in that approximate area off in the distance. You crank up the zoom, the boat's there, the entire boat. And depending on weather conditions, you know, because some of it has to do with barometric pressure and humidity and temperature and all that other fun stuff. And it changes from hour to hour. But but you can bring boats back into frame and that shouldn't be possible. Eventually, that boat should not be there anymore because it's on the other side of the hill. And so that's what, that's what gets most people into Flat Earth. <laughs> Uh, I, I never mentioned it in the clues. They just started running off to beaches wherever they were and shot lighthouses and boats and peninsulas and mountains and, and came back and said, oh, yeah, I can see stuff that, that I shouldn't be able to see. And then slowly but surely, we started working out the details of that. It's been fascinating. So, yeah, that's that's where we are right now. It's, it's the most common flat earth test done because it's so easy to do. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, the thing we're always counting on NASA. We're always seeing pictures from NASA. You know the cover. You know the that the Earth is just a you know a, a blue marble out in space, that right. kind of a thing. Right. And uh, you know, and, and my my uh, philosophy was you know that basically NASA was started by uh, a uh, Nazi rocket scientist and a uh, Satanist out of California. Right. What could go wrong? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> and and the fact that, that people people will tell me every once in a while, luckily I, I don't get that argument anymore, which is it's like, oh, well, NASA isn't a military organization. I'm going, okay, what are you talking about? They're, they're not only military, they're uniquely military. They are built literally on the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. You know, Russia took half the scientists and we took the other half. A little thing about war, which most people do not know is that in war, if you are really, really intelligent, you uh, you are considered an asset. There is a dollar value tied to you, and you are actually worth more to keep around. So it's like the, these Nazi scientists, the same ones that built like the V2 rockets and their, the first cruise missiles and stuff like that, <laughs> they're like, yeah, so you're going to be coming with us over to America. You're going to get complete <laughs> leniency. You know, you're going to get a pass. You're, there's going to be no war crimes for you. We're, we're, you're going you're gonna to work in our facility and everything's going to be super, super great. You're, you're an American now. Or in other way, the other case, you're, you work for the Soviet Union. And yeah, so Werner von Braun, you know, one of the, one of the big, he was the, the high profile guy over there in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, he was guy, and and up until his dying day, he was he was the guy tied to NASA. Uh, and and when he died in 1977, same year that Elvis died, by the way, uh, he um, he wasn't replaced by anybody. There is no go-to NASA guy. There's a go-to science guy, which is Neil Tyson, and before that, it was Carl Sagan. But there is no go-to NASA guy anymore. All right, sorry, that's my little rant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what fascinates me. I think, how many uh, space agencies are on this planet? Four or five? Five. And I, five I five, a, five I with launch yeah. capability, supposedly. So, 
supposedly. Okay, and, and if you see pictures of the Earth from each of each of these space agencies, they're entirely different. Yes. Like continents are, you know, kind of bigger than they normally are. I mean, explain to me which one's the real one. Is the one NASA came out with, or is it uh, these other guys? I, that's I'd like to know which one's the real McCoy here. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. Which is, by the way, in my opinion, why the Russians stopped the space race. You know, for, for those of you who are old enough, there was a space race between us and the Soviet Union. And it was like, who's going to get to the moon first? And the Russia has had this huge lead. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> Americans out of nowhere, we took six round trips to the moon. Perfect, except for Apollo 13, which is a whole other thing. And during that time, Russia just quit. They was like, well, that's it. We're pack it in. We're going home. It's like, what do you mean? It was a space race. It's like I knew how it was supposed to go, like everything else. You know, they we put we put a small base on the moon. They put a bigger base, and then so on and so on until finally, Time Magazine runs a story that says, "Has the Cold War reached the moon?" That's how it should have gone. But to your point, they realized that from a from a studio consistency standpoint, you can't have two simultaneous programs, especially in other countries like this where two countries, if you're going to fake it, you can't have two countries faking it on the moon at the same time because both studios can't do it identically. And if it's not completely identical, uh, it's you're screwed. I mean, come on, the same studio, when they have to do reshoots, screw up reshoot sets all the time, and that's the same freaking studio. So if you have one group out of Moscow and another group out of an Air, Air Force in Nevada trying to do moon simulations... You know, unless you're using the exact same camera lenses and dirt and lighting and everything else, you're going to find some some consistency issues and the nerds are going to call it out. They're going to call it out in two seconds. And so Amer the, the United States called Russia and said, yeah, just just we'll we'll handle it from here. We've got we've got Hollywood. We got way more camera things that we can use for options. You guys just fade away. And that's what they did. Russia just was like, well, they don't even talk about it. There is I I find me an article. It's like why why Russia quit? Why the Soviet Union quit in the in the late sixties, early seventies? I mean, the Soviet Union didn't even fall until what ninety two. Anyway, yeah, I mean, and I've seen the videos. Of, was it uh, was it ISS or something that's supposed to be going up there? And we have a, uh, uh, you know astronauts uh, or crew is supposed to be occupying this. Uh, this little space capsule that's, uh, you know, orbiting the planet. Yeah. And I, you know, you guys brought up so many valid points. And I, and plus we see, you know, actual wires. These people are hanging off of wires. And they have, uh, you know, the green, uh, green screen goes funky. Uh, th what kind of Mickey Mouse show is this? I mean, seriously. <laughs> well, and, I mean... <laughs> You know the the part. Well, it it, it kind of goes with. I'll I'll, get, I'll tell you a quick story beforehand. When I go over to other countries, uh, I ask people as other countries. I go look because in America, you know, you have to believe in the space program, right? Because we're Americans. You know, wave the flag, rah rah, go team. And but I say, okay, you in Sweden, you Swedish people, why do you believe the Americans went to the moon, for example? And they will all say the same thing. Well, because it was on television, and you the American news doesn't lie. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> you apparently haven't been paying attention over the last X number of years because that's what we do. I mean, there's a reason why Russia calls us the empire of lies because we, you know, I, I, I will say this. We lie more than Russia does. We lie about everything. So when it comes to the ISS, for example, the production, because the ISS is televised and because it looks official, people believe it. The, the line from the Truman Show going you know, back to 1998, which is, we believe the world that is presented to us. Now, that's not a unique quote. The psychologists have been dealing with this for years and years and years, which is most people believe the world that is, that is presented to them if there's a consensus. If a whole bunch of people around you believe something, chances are you're going to believe it too. Look up the ASH experiment, ASC where a group of people can convince a lone person in the room of something that's absolutely false, that he knows to be false, but he doesn't want to stick out in the crowd. So when it comes to the ISS, you know, the, the part that bugged me about the ISS wasn't the, the, the layering difficulties or the wires or anything like, you know what it was? It was something simple. It was the hair. 
And it wasn't just that they they put women's hair up that they permed it, to, you know, to make it look to simulate anti gravity, which of course is not what would happen in gravity. We we know because we can we can do a gravity simulator with a um, uh, a nose drop plane, you know, uh, the vomit comet. Where, you know, it's just like a swimming pool. A woman's hair flows like it would be in a swimming pool, which is why you're forced to have swimming caps in, in public pools because when that long hair breaks off, it completely screws up the filters. The question is, isn't why, why are the women's hair permed? It's why are the astronauts have any hair at all? I mean, any hair at all. Because that hair in, you know, microgravity or zero gravity would clog up the filters instantly. So you would shave people's heads. You would have them wearing caps or little hats or what. You even shave, probably even shave eyebrow hairs if you were really strict about it. But oh no, all those early missions for decades. It's like, oh no, no, they're going to let the women have full-blown loose hair. Half of it wasn't even tied back. It's only recently that they, they went more to the shorter hair, but there should not be, even be body hair at all. But again, the people, the, the average person doesn't get it. I'll give you one more real quick, which is the, the, we'll go back to Apollo, which is, and I made a clue about this, which was the spacesuit cannot do what it says it does because of what things do in a vacuum. You can look up on YouTube, anything in a vacuum all day long, soda can, uh, volleyball, football, anything that's pressurized, you put that in a vacuum chamber, it will expand until it explodes. The only thing that has never done that is the spacesuit. Even though the spacesuit is really just a, a loose fabric, you know, pressurized loose fabric, no different than a, um, a beach volleyball, really. And it never expands. It's got full flexibility, full articulations. You can move your fingers, your arms, your, your elbows. You can bend everything just fine. It should not happen. And every time I ask anybody in science, anybody in science, I say, what magical thing do you have in that backpack that counteracts the physics law? that says that pressure cannot exist to, next to non-pressure without a barrier. And they just stare at me. They, they got nothing. And it's like, all right, well, there you go. Which goes, again, goes into why is our atmosphere still here? But I'm sorry, I'm, I'm ranting because that's what I do. What else you got? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, the next thing is, you know, I have a good friend of mine who's an engineer. He's working satellites and that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, he says... You know, I, and I kind of, you know, pitched the idea to him. I said, what do you think? You know, and of course he said, he poo-pooed it because, hey, we've got orbiting satellites. Uh, you know, why do you think we have satellite dishes? Why do you think the dishes would move back and forth back in the early days? You know, the big giant dishes people had in the backyard so they could watch their favorite Playboy channel, right? Right. And so they're going back and forth. He said, why do you think it does all that? It's because uh, the Earth is moving. It's, uh, it's uh, rotating, and you have the orbiting satellites. In it. Now, okay, all right. Please. Okay. What is your... Two... two why do yeah, okay. we have satellites? Uh, okay. First off, do I believe in satellites? Yes, I do. You uh, you can look up the high altitude balloon, NASA balloon projects. They've been running them since the 50s. NASA is the largest consumer uh, and owner of helium in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been launching balloon payloads, big ones, for decades, ever since the 50s. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, you can launch things upwards of four tons, about 8,000 pounds on balloons. And the question is, well, what are they putting on rockets? Because you're not going to put an 8,000 pound uh, satellite on top of rockets. Like, no, you're not. For pennies on the dollar, you can put it on a balloon, get it up to like 30, 50, whatever miles you want. And you can control. It's not like weather balloons where they get up to a certain point and just pop. You can you can you can regulate the uh, the elevation and keep them up there for a very very long time. Because what's going to run into them at that height? Pretty much nothing. Um, when it comes to the old school satellite dishes, and I'm old enough to remember those. You know, every once in a while you'd run into somebody with one of those giant things in their backyard. Um, those actually probably did point at satellites, but then all the new ones are uh, supplemented by cell towers. You know, there's cell towers everywhere now everywhere i mean even where i am on a little island up near canada uh there's cell towers so you, you can't miss them uh the only reason you, you don't notice them right away is because they they're not brightly colored they look kind of like giant telephone poles but those are what really power all the direct tv stuff everything's bouncing off cell towers all, and all the cell cell people know this you know, they say, "Oh, yeah, they, they, you know, the the running joke is okay. You, one of the one of the triangulations you have to point at a satellite, but most of the time, the the veterans like, yeah, we don't point at satellites. You just pick up another cell tower. You know, you triangulate between three of them and hope you get a, a decent signal. 
So, but are, do satellites, are, do they exist? Are they up there? Sure, you bet. NASA launches tons and tons of them from different parts of the, the world all the time. However, that being said, 95, maybe 98% of the bandwidth, including the bandwidth we're talking on now, is done with old school. The undersea telegraph tables, which turned into undersea telephone cables, which turned into fiber optics, those have never changed, you know, because why Why screw up a good thing? They're completely solid. You know, you just run it, you know, giant, ridiculously long cables from one country to an, another covering the ocean floor with huge ships and you just upgrade them whenever you can. And there's some wonderful maps up there showing all the connections between the countries. We are connected hardline between the countries. That's where most of the data comes from. And now, Mark, I tell you what, this is Dr. John. I've got a, I want to revisit uh, the, the NASA thing um, and something that I said when I was a tiny little kid, and we, were, me and my dad were watching uh, the moon <laughs> uh, expose going on. Yeah. And Neil Armstrong was having a real-time talk with Houston Mission Control. Yeah. Like... We are having a real-time conversation. I talk, you talk, Brad talks, whatever. And I looked at my dad because my dad did telecommunications in World War II. And I said, well, Daddy, we know that back then everybody knew that the moon was a quarter of a million miles away. Right. That was the one thing that universally every, everybody happened to know because, you know because of the space program. Right. And I said, Daddy, the, what is wrong? Because there should be a... A delay, because I mean, a quarter of a million miles is an awful long way for signals to travel. And he said, "You know, son, I think it's like eight or ten seconds or something like that delay." You're right. Yep. I mean, Neil Armstrong just talked real time with him, and I mean, and I said, "Something's wrong." He said, "Son, I don't know. You got a good point." Now. I just I just wanted to bring that up because I was proud of myself. I was probably eight. I don't know. I, I was, and, I was and, a little kid. And good. Even I knew something was wrong there. Yeah. I mean, but and, be, and, and, didn't, and didn't didn't Stanley Kubrick even admit to being the director of all that? Well, not publicly. Didn't, Stanley Kubrick. And to your point, by the way, before you get to Stanley Kubrick, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Where uh, there was no. Uh, trying to beam a transmission, pinpoint that to the moon, I tell, you know, an, uh, uh, an audio transmission, you know, send and receive to the moon is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. And from the other side, what are you using to, to send the signal back, right? The, the transmitter that the, the lander had was running off literally a car battery. And it's a VHF transmitter, and on a good day, a really good day, it may have uh, 50 miles of range. And that's Morse code. And yet this thing was not only transmitting perfect two-way communication with no delay, which, of course, completely, that, that's impossible, but also uh, 10 frames of color video a second. It, color video a second. And it's like, how? How are you? How are you doing this? We, you, there's there's no engineering feat that that can you know. But because it was on television, people believed it. They believed the transmission. Uh, they believed the spacesuits. They're walking around because it was on TV. It's like, well, it's there. We're watching it. So unless they're completely lying to us, and most people don't want to, you know, denial is a very very powerful thing. To back to Stanley Kubrick though. Stanley Kubrick in a in a wonderful there was a documentary called um, Room Two Three Seven I believe, uh, where a guy when you know Stanley Kubrick did not make a lot of movies but he was highly regarded as a very precise highly intelligent director that wove in symbolism to all his movies, uh, especially Eyes Wide Shut which was the last movie he ever did in 1999 but one of his big movies was The Shining with Jack Nicholson in 1980. And that was based off of Stephen King's book, Loosely. And by that, he kind of threw away the book and decided to build in his story of working with NASA into that, that show. You know, and so if you, you want all the details, I won't go into them here. It, it's, it's, it goes down frame by frame. And we didn't even, the, the, the truther community didn't even figure it out until the Blu-ray came out and you could go frame by frame and see what he did in the sets. But he was basically saying, basically 
telling everybody in that film that he worked with NASA and NASA, you know, they they gave they promised him the world, you know, you know, unlimited budget, as much time as he wanted. They gave him five years to work on the the technical details, and then they took what he had and and turned you know turned it into a news broadcast. And then he took his version. He asked them, it's like, hey, can I take what I've been working on for five years and turn it into a movie? And they're like, yeah, you know, make it fictional, of course. And that's when he came up with 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. And it still holds up to the to uh, Blu-ray specs today. So there you go. Oh, it certainly does. It's, it's uh, really, I think, 2001. The only problem is I get so damn tired of the Blue Danube Waltz. But other than yeah. Other than, other than that, I mean, you know, why, why didn't they use Waltz Number no. Two by Shostakovich? Yeah. Much better tune. I mean, I guess <laughs> that was uh, in, in deference to uh, to Russia. They wanted to penalize Russia even more. I mean, it's just you know, politics are a mess. But sure. you know, yeah. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump in and I'm gonna ask you to do a little more explanation. You said you'd do it if we'd ask. I would really like to hear it. I have not heard this. And what's wonderful is this is permanently archived on ScaryCast at Blog Talk Network. Yeah. And uh, that's what I love about this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to publicize the, the stuffing out of this thing because this is the most – this is truly one of, one of the most interesting things we have ever discussed. So do you mind sharing with us a few more details of that? Of, of which part? The Stanley Kubrick thing? Yeah, Kubrick and, and, and what he embedded in the film. Oh, yeah. Yeah, can do. The, so in what the reason why the documentary, and I highly recommend it for anybody, you can find it on YouTube and Rumble and places like that. Um, it's called Room 237, is that in it, uh, some of the key points was that literally in the hotel, if you know anything about the movie The Shining, the, the horror movie, um, room 2371, it didn't exist. Uh, 237 stands for 237,000 miles to the moon. And when he put the, this was back in the days when you, you got your key and your keychain, and the keychain said, um, I think it was room NO, and it was an anagram for moon room. And when you went in it, you were, you were fully explained, you were told during the movie that nothing in that room was real. And when you went in, if you remember the movie, there was this beautiful woman initially, but she turned into a nightmare later, which was the promise that he had, he had made, which was um, uh, he was given, which was, look, we'll give you five years. Basically, the, the story goes that is that he was given five years to, to make this movie, at least, you know, and and th- with with a complete blank check. And they even allowed some of that money to develop lenses that hadn't even been invented yet. I mean, he was way, way ahead of its time. And somewhere along there, if you remember the move, a part of the movie where the uh, uh, the black caretaker came back and was killed, that was the Scatman Crothers. Yep, there yeah. you go. He was he was sa- not sacrificed, but it was one of those things where you know Stanley Kubrick figured out at some point what he was doing. You know, he suspected what he was doing here, which was he was he was not he wasn't making a movie. He was trying to figure out what how a space program could be faked on film. And he told somebody it's and we don't know who it is yet. But one of his friends, I suppose I could do some digging on that one, um, was killed. And that's what he was implying, which was that. That if, you know, the government was absolutely serious, you did not mess with these guys. They were always in the background in, in the movie. The, the, uh, uh, another, like the hotel manager had a, like, a, like a bodyguard, which was weird. Like this guy, other guy in the room, you didn't know who he was. And they were always watching him, always on, on top of him. And he realized shortly that, you know, the, the director's dream, which is, you know, you, every director wants to go to somebody and, and say, oh, yeah, you can, you know, directors are always under a time crunch and always under a budget, budget crunch. And he was under neither. He was like, nope, you can you can take three times, lo- four times longer than anybody's ever done to make a movie to uh, what we want the, the stuff. Anyway, so he bailed at the end. Which which meant that uh, he realized that he didn't want to get in, into bed with the government was not going to be, you know, the government and creative types are always going to clash. And because of that, 
the government kind of panicked and that is why by the way they um when they when they showed the Apollo footage on television, again, most people don't know, they would not, which is, I can't believe that they got away with it back then. They would not let the networks get the direct feed, meaning the networks had to come to a NASA facility, set up their cameras, and record it second generation off a screen they were broadcasting. And the networks were just beside themselves. It's like, what are you talking about? It's like, why? Is, that doesn't even make sense. Like, the video quality is going to be so degraded that uh, that it's it's going to be you know borderline useless. Which, by the way, is why the the whole movie Capricorn One was created. Was there was a CBS affiliate that was you know watching the Apollo broadcast that was filmed second generation from I think Kennedy or uh, or one of the the NASA facilities, and he was going, I could make. A better production than this, and you know, it wasn't saying that it was fake, but he was he was saying that the production value was terrible. And he goes, he goes, heck, I could make a better Mars mission than these guys are making a moon mission. And so he made a movie about a fake Mars mission called Capricorn One, which is still, I think, it has aged very, very well. Uh, and the, and the premise was awesome that that you know you could go to astronauts and you could fake the whole thing on on a television thing and very few people would have to know that was the brilliance of it is that night in that movie 99 percent of the nasa employees didn't have to know anything only the feed guys and the telemetry guys needed to know and that was a very small number of guys and if, and then you could monitor them if one of them got out of line you could make sure they they didn't, weren't around anymore so anyway, I highly recommend. You know, and, and one, I, Sorry, go ahead. I, I got one other point that, that, that I want to make. And, and I think this is um, I think this is important and I just forgot what I was going to say. This is terrible. Uh, oh yeah. Back when Apollo fourteen was launching off the moon. Yeah. I have a PhD in computer science from North Carolina State University. Yeah. We did not have the computing power to compute all that to bring that module back to one within one square mile of Earth. We did not. We could not compute that. Sure. That takes pretty close to a supercomputer, and I mean, you know, it, it would take forever because there's so many variables. I mean, there, every around every corner, there's a variable. And there's something called, oh, I'm sorry to say this, the Van Allen radiation belt. Yeah. You know? I mean, now, now, so what I'm saying is we did not have the technology. We did not have the digital technology. No. To do that moon project. No, no. To do that moon project. We just didn't. No. We... And I've always said it, and everybody looks at me like, well, you know, well, they look at me like before I was working at the Ryan Research Institute, and I started telling everybody to shut up. But I know what I'm talking about, and then they, now they don't persecute me anymore. But we did not have the technology, the digital technology, to do all that. No, we did. We did not. We. You're right. The okay. I'm. I'm, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get off my soapbox. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back to Brad. Brad is doing a great job. But I have wanted all my life to say that, and now I said it on, on international internet radio. Nice. We didn't have the damn technology. We did not. You're right. Okay, Brad. It's you. All right. Here we go. Here we go, and uh, this is a point that I, that John and I have uh, spoken about off the air uh, concerning Antarctica. All right, I think it was in memory serves. It was a Captain Cook that did a survey of the uh, of the continent, and he went around the entire coast and came up with a calculation of roughly sixty thousand miles. Right? Am I right about this? Yeah, I mean it's not one of my favorites because you can't prove it. You know, it's like it's just one one ship okay. ship captain. But I but I do like the premise. I do like the premise. Okay, and so the, the, from what I understand, it, with flat earthers, um, you, basically we're surrounded by an ice wall, yeah. and that ice wall has been represented to us as being Antarctica. Sure. Am I right about this, or, or yep. how does that work? Yeah, yeah, it does. And by ice wall, and I know that kind of people get confused because they think Game of Thrones, you know, that whole that whole ice wall. Uh, what what we're saying is is that it's the shoreline of Antarctica, but the shoreline of Antarctica isn't like the shoreline of any other continent. It is mostly ice and snow going up over a hundred feet, uh, and then it and it goes up to I think the average was the average elevation of um, uh, of the continent is what fourteen thousand something like that nine thousand fourteen thousand 
So it's 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 way up there. I mean, it's, it's higher than altitude sickness. Just so you know, altitude ki- sickness kicks in at about seven thousand feet, and uh, so yeah, the the everything around us, as far as the the coast, is the coastline of Antarctica. Huh. Yeah. I, okay. Well, well, now, I kind of wonder about this. I heard so many stories. Sorry. Oh no, no. I mean, Antarctica well, I mean, is is highly unusual. There's the ever no no other continent. Again, it, mainstream science is the first one to admit it. It's like no other continent is that high. It's ridiculously high, and it's like wow. But, but because nobody goes in there, it's the least explored, you know, least populated place in the world. Uh, you, you know, it's it's just not common knowledge. Well, you know, here, here's here's my, my view. Why is why that Antarctic Treaty? I mean, why hasn't Russia blown in there and taken over Antarctica? Why yeah. haven't we blown in there and taken over Antarctica? Yeah. I mean, what you know, it, it makes no sense that there's essentially nobody down there but a few scientists. Yeah. The, mean, the, the good. Well, I know why. It's because you you don't want people out there. You do not. You want to restrict as much travel as to Antarctica as possible. The the part that that got me about Antarctica and the treaty, you know, the Antarctica Treaty is the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. You know, it's a, it's like you know you've heard like like crooked politician. We are in, in, in the treaties are broken. Treaties are always broken. That's the whole point of treaties. It's like, oh, how long is this going to last? The only unbroken treaty is the Antarctic Treaty, and it's been in effect since uh, 1959, and it's not even up for debate until 2041. You say, oh, 2041 isn't that long from now. Well, not long necessarily from now, but in 1959, you're going you're gonna to put a, a date out there 80 years in the future? Come on. No. And, 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 and not only that, but it says no country can own Antarctica, nor any, any company, no matter how much money they have, uh, can set up shop there. And it's just like, wow, how are you, I mean, in America, that's, that's all, that's a, that's a joke. I mean, you can start fracking in somebody's backyard tomorrow if you wanted to. And that's just, you know, just give them gobs of cash. You're telling me no amount of cash can bribe people to get things going in Antarctica? It's absolutely true. The only people that are down there are the military and military scientists. But because nobody wants to go to Antarctica, nobody questions it. I mean, it's a very hostile place. It just screams, go away. It's just ice and snow and wind and, and awfulness. But, you know, people, and, and it's, you know, and it's really, really expensive. You, you know, you want to go down there and take a trip to the beach of Antarctica, you could, it's, I think it would run you about, I think, 15,000 American. That's a lot of money. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You know, I was just wondering. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of leads me to another thing that, you know, I've, I've heard, of, uh, I've seen a lot of shows that you've done about, um, you know, the way the aero airline industry you know why why do they have the routes they have you know if you look at it on paper it doesn't make any sense i'll I'll give you a real simple example why is it that you know if you're traveling from uh say uh atlanta georgia to los angeles california if you see the flight path if never fly non-stop the flight path would be curved i mean it would not be a straight line it would be you know way off okay why is that you mean, I've heard it's a geometrical because the well, if, of the Earth is shorter to go, make that curve. If yeah, yeah, if you're showing it on a globe map, they call it part of the Great Circle, which is you have to show an arcing thing to account for the globe, which is why they do that. It's it's to accentuate the point. But on a flat Earth model, it you know it's just a straight line, and that's uh, just so many different ways I could go with this. Do not forget the GPS. Tells is is a government United States government system, meaning it was built by the U.S. military back in the 90s, and it's really just an extension of the old Loran system, which is a ground-based radar system. So the GPS system, now that it's integrated with all sorts of different different devices, it will not only tell you where you are, but it'll tell you where they want you to think you are. So pilots, yeah, they just take it for granted, and they have to. If they have to make course corrections, they make course corrections. They don't question it because the GPS would never lie. 
but I've talked to a number of pilots and air traffic controllers and all sorts of different people that say the dead spots, by the way, because there should be no dead spots. If it's 30-something, 36 orbiting satellites with multiple blanket coverage, there shouldn't be any dead spots. Oh, yeah, maybe a few over water, but there shouldn't be. But there definitely shouldn't be any over land. And they say, oh, yeah, there's dead spots over land all the time where GPS just drops off. And then picks back up, you know, after you get down range a little further. And people just kind of connect the dots. It's like, well, it's just one of those things. So, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Well, and, and could you kind of give the audience a few examples of some of these strange air routes? I mean, the, the way the uh, the way they have the planes routed, it just doesn't make any sense. Oh, I think uh, one example that you guys brought up was... Go ahead. Oh, yeah. The, well, the if you want, you know, I again, we can't cover them all here, but there's a wonderful book out there called, I think, 16 Emergency Flights on Flat Earth. I'm, I'm butchering the title, I'm sure, a little bit. But it was uh, written by one of our, or compiled by one of our guys over in Japan. And he uh, he noticed that when there's an emergency on a flight, those that's where you get the, the best examples. You know, like somebody you know gets sick, somebody dies, somebody gets pregnant, or no, not gets pregnant. Is going to have um, uh, <laughs> yeah, that happens on planes too. But no, somebody's going to give give birth uh, uh, on a on a flight. They have to divert. You know, you have to divert to the closest airport to get you know to a health facility. And the, one of my favorite examples was one that was going, I think, from Philippines to Los Angeles. And the flight route was going to have them be- going right next to Hawaii. And they were only like an hour into the flight. And you can tell it was like bearing down in Hawaii. And the, the a woman would start giving birth. And they rerouted the plane north to Anchorage. And it's like, why would you ever go to Anchorage? It's like, oh, first off, Hawaii's got way more hospitals and probably better hospitals, and no offense to Anchorage. Uh, but, I mean, you know, there's a reason why we pay people to live in Alaska. And the the other thing, w- when you look at it on a flat map, you realize that on a globe map, yes, the route looks like it's going to go right next to Hawaii. But on a flat map, it's going right next to Alaska. And the pilots don't say anything because that's the last thing from their mind. They, the, the old saying is, which is, you can't see the forest for the trees, which is, why would the pilots ever think that? And I talked about this in different videos, where the pilots, the, the last thing they're ever going to think is, oh, well, the earth must be flat. But once the word started getting out there, the pilots started coming to me and coming to, coming to some of our people and saying, yeah, so you're not wrong about this. There's, but what what are you gonna do if you're if you're a pilot? Most of the time, you can't say anything because they will ground you for for less offenses. Uh, notably, which I also said in one of my videos, where it's like, look, if you if you're a pilot and you say that you be, you were chased by a UFO for like an hour, you're benched. You know, if you talk to the press about that, you are absolutely freaking benched. So and but so if you want to go, I mean, we have one of our one of our people who was a KLM pilot over in Europe, and she said, you know, they do physicals, corporate physicals every so often, and she uh, she mentioned to us, hey, just you know, I think the Earth is flat, and I think she was almost daring him, and he goes, yeah, you can't you can't fly until you renounce that, until you walk that back, and they um and she wouldn't, and so as far as I know, she's uh she's she's not flying anymore. So yeah, pilot pilots are funny. Yeah. They they I well, I I know a bunch of pilots that, that believe in it, but they don't. A lot most of them don't want to say it publicly because you know they want to pay the rent. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what gets me is okay. Uh, all right, there's two questions in certain planes again. Uh, because of the rotation on the Earth. Okay. It seems to me, uh, how is it? Uh, let's see, it goes from, uh, what is it, east to west? Is that how, what's the rotation of the Earth? Uh, Which direction is it supposed to travel? Uh, I think it's west. No, it's it's west to east because the sun, again, if it's the. It if it's west, the east, but yeah. west to east because the sun goes from east to west. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So it, it seems to me, well, if you're, why is it, why does it take a, uh, approximately the same amount of time to fly from, uh, again, Atlanta to Los Angeles as it does from Los Angeles to Atlanta when the earth is spinning, you know, a thousand miles an hour? Yes. Yes. And, and that's also an excellent point, which is gravity supposedly locks in, you know, locks in the aircraft. It's like, okay, does it lock in in both ways? 
You know, if it locks it and and how fast does that aircraft have to I've never heard this. How fast does that aircraft have to be going to break away from that gravity? Is there such a speed? Uh, and when you get up, if you can break away from that, oh, is the Earth then rotating a thousand miles an hour in a direction that, you know, r- relative to yours, a different direction? It doesn't. There's there's. But again, we take it for granted. But come on, it, I could I could give you a laundry list of things that science can't explain, but because it's repeatable, they just go along with it. Uh, you know, one of my favorites. I mean, here's a great one, you know, tied to planes. You probably don't know this. Which is, you know, we all know, it, well, if you know anything about physics, uh, how planes get off the ground, right? Where, you know, the, the air goes over the top of the, the wing and, you know, it's curved. Air goes faster over a curved surface and, you know, the bottom of the wing is flat and therefore it creates this lift. And then, you know, the faster you go, the more lift you have. And then, but, but when you ask the, the scientists, you say, oh, yeah, why does it go faster over a curved surface? They don't know. <laughs> it just does. <laughs> and since it's repeatable and the plane goes from here to there, they don't care. And it's, it, but no one talks about it. It's like, okay, that's fine, I guess, you know, but because, you know, science, that's the, the notorious thing about science. If it's repeatable, it's science. Doesn't matter how weird it is. If it's repeatable, the, it's under their banner. I'm like, all right, that's fine. Like, again, why do yeah. I mention that? Because gravity is the same way. Every scientist, I don't care who you are, that will always tell you the same thing. We can't tell you what gravity is. We can only tell you what it does. We can only tell you the symptoms of it. You know, what, what, how, how it affects things. We cannot tell you what started it, what's causing it. We can guess, but we have no idea. Anyway, go ahead. I mean, speaking of, you know, sort of about gravity okay like when a when a uh, a jet is going 600 miles an hour it, it, it seems to me that thing has to be in constant dive mode if not it'd be shooting out into the ionosphere i mean oh I yeah am I yeah wrong? i mean why do they yeah, no, you're, you're right there as well, which is there's a secondary thing wrong with planes. Not only would they have to deal with the, the spin of the Earth, but the actual curve of the Earth. It's meaning, you know, the faster, you know, you go, the faster you have to either nose down or nose up, depending on, on what you're talking about. And by that, I mean, if the Earth is curving underneath you as a, at a plane, you know, a plane, you know, you're only traveling 10 miles an hour, you don't have to really adjust much at all. You know, it, it, it would take forever. But if you're going five, 600 miles an hour, you're having to nose down or nose up all the time and i can't tell you how many business travel trips i've done you know exactly when the plane is nosing down even a few hundred feet you feel it you absolutely know it and when a plane gets up to cruising altitude on a really nice day and kicks in cruise control i mean you can sit there and you can watch your water glass and it does not budge not a moment i mean it is absolutely tabletop stable and it's like, and you're thinking, and of course, we take it for granted. It's like, oh, hey, it's a smooth flight. It's like, yeah, but it shouldn't be. You should be nosing down or nosing up every couple minutes and not just a little bit, quite a bit. And if you don't do that every couple minutes, you're going to be, uh, you know, eventually you're going to have to correct a couple thousand feet. It's going to freak people out. Never happens. Never happens. And pilots don't talk about it, nor do they even think about it. It doesn't it doesn't even occur to them, the, the curvature of the earth, because it, it's again it's it's not talked about, it's not in their equation. Same thing with the military guys that um, fire weapons systems that, you know that are longer than a mile, longer than a sniper. And uh, they, they all say, Oh yeah, we, we never take the curvature or the spin of the earth into the firing solutions. Oh, it's in the manual. We just never use it. It's weird. In fact, it's, it's like, I don't even know why it's in the manual. It never comes into it. The The military guys, in fact, they, they, it's a, a tanker friend of mine. He jokes about it. He goes, do you know how different war would be if you had to take into account the spin of the earth when you're firing things? You know, Because all of a sudden you'd have to be like, if you're trying to go for precise fire missions, you would have to know not just where you were on the map, but where you were on the globe, because then the spin of the earth would be different depending on where you were, north, south. Ugh, uh-huh. it's frustrating. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's just incredible. Uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Don, is there any other questions that you have for this young man? Well, here's, here's what I've got to say. Yeah. Nobody has asked me what I believe. Do I think the earth is flat or do I think it's a sphere? But I'm going to offer that up. I think it's both. 
I think it's the double slit. Exp- it's the most unbelievable double slit experiment. It's what you want it to be. You can prove it to be either one you wish. You can come up with enough <coughs> enough answers to make it either one you want. Now, wh- which one is it? You know, it doesn't matter. I'm driving along a highway right now, and I- I'm doing just fine. But I just think there's 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 so many inconsistencies to 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 both arguments. And and Mark, I hope you. Do, would you give me just like a a, a one minute re- re- reply to that? There there are inconsistencies with everything about the Earth, don't you think? Yes. However, to to that point, uh, could you? Okay. G- there are all sorts of globe people. You know, a huge amount of people that believe in the globe. Most of the people though that believe in the globe <clears throat> don't know why they believe in it. They believe it. it uh, I'll give you a, gr- a great example. Um, George Orwell, the creator of um, 1984, he he wrote this thing. He goes, when asked to, to um, uh, he goes, you could go to anybody on the street. And this was back in 1946. He goes, get you on the street and ask them, how do you know the earth is a globe? Right. And they would say, well, what are you talking about? It's a dumb question. We know. And he goes, really? How do you know? And. What he realized was, and he, was, he wasn't talking about flat earth, round earth. He was talking about just people believing in science, which was science says it's a globe, therefore it's a globe. And so people get angry because they, do, they don't know it's a globe. They were told it's a globe, and they just believed it, and it goes back generations, so they didn't have a chance. There are way more. Well, I, well, I can tell you, I'm, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you exactly why. Because in the, in the second or third grade, you had a globe of the Earth in your classroom. Sure. And that's what you were shown. Yep. And nobody, nobody ever gave you a, any alternative. I mean, it's just, it's just there. Yeah. And I remember learning all the countries, and it was, it was so much fun. Yeah. You know, and, and also I remember when Cuba was smaller. And, when, and I remember when the Panama Canal went north-south. I remember that very well. I, I wrote a paper on that. Did you know that, Did you know that Brad Mulder? I wrote a paper on, on why the uh, Panama Canal is north-south. wonder why. But I, that paper's gone. No, but to, to your point, there are way... To, oh, l- let me get this out real quick. There are way more... Uh, are there holes in the flat earth theory? Sure. Not many, though, compared to the globe. For every hole that we have, there are 10 holes in the globe theory, which is why we tend to resonate more. It's way easier to understand our model, and we've got way more arguments against the globe than they have against us. So that's why I keep doing what I'm doing. Okay. I know. Right. And, 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 yeah, and, and, my question it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting. Yes, Brad? Okay, my question is, okay, if it's not a globe, what is it? Oh, sure. Uh, it is a building, a structure with walls and a floor and a ceiling, probably angled off, probably squared off at the edges, but inside we have some sort of dinner plate pond, you know, shaped pond, and inside that are the islands, which are the continents. Uh, where this building is, for anybody's guess, I mean, I try to live one world at a time, Is a, do I think it's a one-off or do I think we're on a table with a whole bunch of other ponds and God's is kind of looking at us from time to time? That's that's my my best guess. Are, could it be that there are other continents outside of this one and we're part of even a, a much bigger structure than that and we're just sealed off on a, in, a, in a small section on the inside? <clears throat> Could be. I'm not going to discount anything. All I do know, and the reason why the community keeps moving forward and keeps getting bigger and bigger, at the end of the day, we all agree that it's not a globe. Are there disagreements on exactly what we're in? Sure, you bet. And why wouldn't there be? Uh, you know, we've only been doing this for eight years. But uh, for, for us, we're still, we are, our common enemy is the sphere itself. Yeah. Uh, well, my, I have uh, two ideas as to what it could be. Either, either this planet, if it is a planet, is bigger than what we've been told, mm. number one. Yeah. Or number two, this, this planet, if it is still a sphere, it's basically like a uh, like Epcot Center or, or a uh, you know a geodesic dome, you know, a buckyball. Sure. It's made out of flat planes. Sure. That's a possibility. I mean, hey, you're you're you're. Uh, you know, your ideas are just as good as mine because I don't think anybody knows the truth. And, and like I said, I depended on, I'm one of those people, I depend on NASA, and I have been let down. Yeah. And I don't trust anything that happens now. 
Yeah, so, I I know. But that's all I have to say. I know, but at the same time, look, I, I as much as I'd like to condemn NASA, don't forget that back in the day, back in 1959, 1958, when NASA was founded, the whole idea was, was the public ready to be told something like this? And they had already seen what happened with Roswell in 1947, and they were like, uh, yeah, maybe we should hold off. So... I, I, I would have done that. I've said this many times. I would have done the same thing back then. Do I think the public can handle it now? Sure, because you can control the narrative now. Uh, you, you've got six billion smartphones in the world and, and you can put, you know, you can push out the message you need to. But back in 19, in, you know, when they figured it out about 1960, it's like, nah, they weren't ready. Not even close. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. This is great. I mean, you know, wow. I'm, I'm, I'll just say that, uh, Mark, I'm glad you agree that, but, you know, both theories have problems. Therefore, what on what is really going on here? Uh, you know, that, that's kind of where I am because, I mean, but I think you're right. I think the globe, the globalists have, have far more problems than the flat earthers. Flat earthers just... Guys, it's flat, and that's it. Yeah. So I mean, it's like, what is going on? And and you know, you know, here at ScaryCast, we deal with flat Earth, round Earth. We deal with cryptids. We deal with ghosts. We deal with UFOs, which might not be UFOs at all. It might just be our own government. Yeah, you know, we don't know. There are so many things about this world that we don't know. Right. And I think that's what makes it. That's what really makes it interesting. And it's a you know it's I think it's kind of a wonderful place to be, don't you? Yeah, I do. Uh, for for me, it has always been uh, flat Earth turned the empty, lonely, purposeless universe, uh, you know, where you're just a residue, a leftover from the Big Bang, to something that's deliberate. If if it is flat, you know, if it, you're living in a building, an enclosed world, then you're here for a reason. It was built here for it was built for you. The universe becomes way smaller, way more intimate, and you know, the you are given purpose where before there was none. Now, what that purpose is, don't know exactly, uh, but I know you're not alone, and there's someone looking out for you. That is so well put, Brad. Do you, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you agree that is one of the most eloquent statements we've ever heard? Uh, yes, I would agree. Yes, 100%. And, uh, you know, again, the things that I look at here, when people, kind of getting back to uh, space, when people look up in the sky, you know, I, I have friends of mine, they'll look in a telescope and say, well, hey, I, I saw the, the, the moon, uh, I saw the moons of another planet from my telescope, <clears throat> and I even saw, you know, the thing revolve uh, around around the planet yeah you know yeah 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 uh okay what are they seeing what, what i mean is this like an illusion is this like a film i mean or, or what are they seeing every uh, in space ev everything in the I mean, and, and, go, ahead. go ahead go ahead i was going to say and also the sun i wanted to get into why do we have daylight and, and night you know what's happening there Okay, every, first off, everything in the sky is no different than a, pl a very, very big, very well-engineered planetarium. Uh, and if you guys don't know what a planetarium is, you know, it's something older people used to do. You know, school kids would go there during the weekdays and, you know, let your eyes adjust and you would see star systems on the ceiling. And on the weekends, they would do like Laser Floyd and Laser Led Zeppelin and you would get stoned and then you would go there on the weekends and say, oh, look at that, it's really cool. So, um... But we, yeah, we're just a, everything in the on the sky in the sky. I don't care what it is; is just a giant ornamental clock system that predates language. That's all it is. Signs and wonders and inspirations. You got a, a big incandescent light bulb during the day and a bright LED light bulb at night, and that's all it really does. I mean, it's it's just really engineered. Can you could we make a planetarium with a sun nowadays? You know, beforehand, we all the best we could do is a moon. But yeah, we could do a sun now. We we've got the tech for it. It wouldn't be super blinding, and I don't think you could use a magnifying glass and burn things with it. But you could make it very very bright. Uh, but that's all we're talking about here. We are talking about a giant planetarium that sits over the top of us. A, a you know a dome. It's not just a, 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 a inert basic dome that doesn't do anything. It's like a giant 
I mean, where are the where are the televisions they're using now? 4K. It'd be a million K television system that's that's above us and very very far away. So it looks great when when you zoom in on it, uh, but it does have its limitations. So there you go. Oh, and as far as day and night, and far as day and night Ooh. goes, um, the sun. It could be could it be a three D object or could it just be two D? I could go with either, but it's very very small and very very close by comparison, which is how you get away with day and night. And, you know, when in in the models, our only drawback when we draw the models of the flat Earth is you have to draw the sun about a thousand miles wide just to make it visible in any sort of artist drawing of it, which is completely incorrect because at a thousand miles wide, you'd be able to see it from everywhere, and there would be no nighttime. Uh, but if it's only 50 miles wide, which is what we kind of think it is, well, then it's this tiny, tiny light source that just moves off into the distance. David Weiss does great experiments and, and has fantastic drone observations where when the sun goes off into the distance, the thickness of the atmosphere just makes it fade away. It's brilliant engineering. It's very, very clever. Yeah. What is the... Uh I think there's some law that David Weiss brought up also, something like light squared or as the, you know, as the further an object is or the light source is, the dimmer it becomes because of, the, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, inverse, the inverse square law of light, which is, which is again, we didn't, come, okay, we, we didn't come up with it. That was mainstream science. You know, we use mainstream science um, information against them which is the they've said that when a light source gets a certain distance away the 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 visibility becomes very very dim right and which is great which is great because when they were doing this they were generally talking about light sources that were here with with us on earth however when you're talking about the stars and then you're saying oh well, that star is 10,000 light years away and people can't even conceive what a light year is you know the closest we can tell we have to measure light speed in miles per second because that makes it somewhat manageable which is 186,000 miles per second or 720 million miles an hour but if you're talking about multiplying that by 10,000 years and then you put in the inverse square law it's like wait you're st you shouldn't be able to see the stars not even close. The stars should not be visible given your science. So one of two things is wrong. Either the stars are not very far away, or the um, uh, or and if that's the case, then the the math is wrong. So there you go. Yeah, I always thought about you know they said well the 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 moon kind of getting back to this i thought how much sunlight you know if we're going by the model on the way i was taught yeah you know how hot would it be on the on the surface of the moon because there's no atmosphere or whatever yeah. and how cold would it be when the sun passed or when it, you know uh and i'm thinking okay we've got a, a temperature a temperature variable here of what about 200 degrees of the way yeah it's like a, it's like a 400 degree variable how in the hell can you survive something like that? You don't. You don't. We don't have. We don't have materials. We do not have an uh, an HVAC system that can compensate for that. Not even close. Not not for something that small. I mean the 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 lander that hit the moon when those two guys. Remember, there's only two guys at any given time with with our landers. The, the systems that we brought with them you know, brought with them could not compensate. And even if they could, the, for the lander, the spacesuit has nothing in it to compensate for that sort of temperature variable. It just doesn't. I mean, you could you could do one or the other. You could protect. Can you protect somebody against 200 degree, you know, negative 200 degrees cold? Yes, you can, you know, with a very efficient heating system. But then you're going to try to go the opposite way and also have that exact same suit, give them a cooling system that can compensate for the, the swing the other way. And you can put that in one backpack and you're going to have that battery powered and it's going to control the oxygen, nitrogen, and it's going to stop the vacuum of space. No, no, no. The only thing in that backpack, the only thing that it did, I mean, the only thing you could even squeeze in there would be the, uh, the oxygen system. That's it, and and I'm not going to go into my secret weapon, which I'm going to ask a, an astronaut eventually. But I will I will mention this to you guys. One of my one of my trick questions um, for anybody, and if you know anybody that scuba dives, which is, and I, I challenge anybody, find me an audio transmission from the Apollo program where they were mentioning how much air they had left before they had to go back to the capsule, and. 
They, because every scuba diver knows this. The only thing you care about when you're scuba diving is your air. You have this giant clock thing in front of you that lets you know how much air you have left. And you're constantly checking it. But the astronauts didn't seem to care. Didn't matter where they were. They was like, just, it never came up. It's like you thought somebody would have mentioned at some point. It's like, oh, hey, we only got nine minutes of air left. Maybe we might kind of get back to the capsule. Nope. Never talked about it. It's like unlimited air. It's like, okay. Sure. Don't know how you did it. Don't want to talk about it. And and, and even if you could, oh. even if you even if you did have a CO two scrubber that could fit in a backpack, uh, nineteen sixty nine. No, no, no. Everything was analog. There's no way you could have monitored that. It, no, no. It. But again, people bought it because oh. we, you know, people believe what is presented. The news. <laughs> nobody believed the news would ever lie back in the sixties. I mean, we were patriots, absolute patriots in the sixties. Well, the crime guy wouldn't lie. Yeah. No. Yeah. I think what gets me is who who put that camera out there on, on the surface of the moon, pointing right at the uh, right at the lander as Neil Armstrong is, you know, walking down those stairs and about ready ready to say those famous words. I like to know where did that camera? Come oh, from? dude, if you're gonna do that, who was running the camera when it when it um, uh, tilted up? When it when it, when it was going back to rendezvous oh, yeah. with the uh, the geosynchronous orbiter, it's it's and and even at NASA people, it's like, well, we just got lucky with that shot. And it's like, really, you got lucky. You compensated for that, and it tilted up exactly where you wanted it to, and made it fade away exactly where you wanted it to. The first time, the only time, you got lucky. And by the way, how'd you transmit that footage back with absolute clarity? How'd you do it? Just just utter you know we people assume a lot and and yeah. the the reason uh, real quick the reason why we get away with it and by that i mean the government the reason why they they get away with it is because the physics clubs the physics clubs in any high school or university are tiny compared to the general population most people don't know anything about physics at all and why would they? They're not going to use it in real life for the most part, but because they don't, they don't know what's possible and what's not possible. And then they're, you know, they just get preyed on by the, the, the people in lab coats. They're like, oh yeah, here's what we're doing. doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter if it defies physics. It doesn't matter. We're, we're just going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. That's cool. I've got a question for you. Sure. For both of you gentlemen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to change topics just slightly. Mark, question for you. Yeah. Do you remember what, what the phrase, the man in the moon, means? Uh, I'm guessing it's the loose trends, you know, the, the face in the moon that people say that they can draw, kind of like uh, as astrology symbols. You know that they can draw on the stars. That they there's there's some sort of face you can draw on the moon. I'm guessing. Okay, Brad, do you know where that phrase comes from? What it means? Same question. Um, I mean, the only thing I remember was the uh, REM song. I think that's a little <laughs> bit different. Uh, <laughs> but well, that's a great. By the way, that's a great song because the that chorus. You know, do you believe we put a man on the moon? You know that that that, would, that predates us a long time ago. You know, you know what? When I was growing up, when the moon was full, it had the ugliest nose. It was the ugliest looking guy I, anybody had ever seen. Huh. The moon was not beautiful, and back in 2012, it changed. It looks like it does now. Man in the moon's gone. But I remember the man in the moon. Hmm. Huh. And, uh, okay? And, and if y'all don't remember it, I mean, you know, some of us have, me have memories that no longer exist. Now, Einstein did put this in his general theory of relativity, is that we could all have different pasts. We seem to, it's just, it's just interesting. You used to be the ugliest looking man I ever saw. And the moon had, believe it or not, a green tint to it. Now, that's not the moon that we have today. Uh, and we can say, well, there's the Mandela effect for you. And there John's just going crazy. Yeah. But I remember what it was like because I, I, I grew up there. And I, and I remember when uh, uh, 
on the longest day of the year, it didn't get dark till about 10, 15 p.m. Now it gets dark at about 9, 15 p.m., and that's really 8, 15 p.m. because of daylight savings time. I mean, just the whole world has changed. And uh, I don't know, I just, I just had to get that question out about the man in the moon. Because I remember, I, oh, yeah. I remember a lot. I remember a lot of things that are just no longer true, or no longer exist. I'm not talking about the Berenstein Bears and, and junk like that. I'm talking about the fact that uh, Cuba's a lot bigger than it was when I was a kid. It was a, it was pretty small back then. But anyway, I don't know. We live in an ever changing yeah. world, and um, and oh my goodness. Uh, it is curtain time now, and Mark, oh. would you go, uh, okay, two things. Number one, would you come back at the beginning of October to help us kick off Flattober? Sure. Sure, I'd be happy to. We got to get you, I don't know what day October 1st is, we're going to have to run a show. Brad Mulder, will you come back and be here for to, to kick off Flattober? Oh, it would be an honor. Well, of course. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. And, and uh, I have and, to say, yeah. What? You have to say what? I want to hear that. I was going to say, it's just, it, it, well, I'm just saying, I, Mark, uh, I am, I really am. I, I love having you on the show. Uh, and I, I, John, thank you for pulling this off. I mean, I, I really did not think, uh, this is the last thing in the world I thought I'd be doing is uh, talking to the one and only Mark. <laughs> well, thank you. Mark, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you back in about in about two months okay. for ScaryCast Monday night, and we'll we'll have we'll have a guest co-host named Brad Mulder, and we we gonna get you on air with with our our bunch of curmudgeons because I frankly loved the last show that we did. It was so much fun. Dr. Trey Dunaway was fit to be tied. I believe he was fit to be tied. Now, if, if Trey listens to this show, Trey, we love you. And you're one of our favorite people in the world. But I don't know. It was it was just so much fun. It's always fun when we have you. And you're like you're like uh, the one constant in the scary cast world. It's great to have you here, Mark. Well, thank it you. It is. Thank you. Appreciate and I it. Say, and, I say, and I want to say thank you very much. And now what I'm going to do, like I always do, I'll do a call around, make sure everybody's okay, and we all had, we one of us had a good time. But from the crew at Scary Cast, which is, and I want to list everybody because we truly have got some of the nicest people God ever put on this planet. We have Robin McRae Haynes, Robin Haynes McRae. We have Dr. Trey Dunaway. We have Chris uh, Chastain. We have Brad Mulder. We have uh matt delf we have kyler smith we have um mark johnston's coming back in two weeks our buddy from the crazy canadian he's coming back and we can still call a crazy canadian a crazy canadian because he is and he's fun and uh and we also have ryan trimbley now of monster radio he's on thursday nights so we've got the greatest cast and crew imaginable and today we truly had one of the best guests we've ever had so i want to say thank you mark Sargent. We'll get you back again, and uh, Mr. Dr. Mulder, you're great. You're always a lot of fun. Me, I just get to sit and complain, and that's my favorite reason to do Scary Cat. So this is Dr. John Stanley saying thank you very much. We'll see everybody on our next broadcast, whatever that is, depending on when you listen to this. But we're on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, just go to facebook.com slash scarycast. And listen, and we'll be we might even be changing platforms here in a couple of months because we might we might move to something else just because uh, we might just do that. It'd be a lot of fun. So I want to say thanks a lot to everybody here, and y'all, as we say in the south, they y'all say goodbye. Okay, say goodbye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Hello, Daisy. Hello, Maggie.